This is Mike from Digital Offensive, and today we're going to cover days 11 through 14. But first off, Happy New Year to everyone. Uh, it's now the new year, 2019, so hopefully everything you want to occur in 2018 happens, uh, such as passing OSCP. Uh, with that being said, I have about 13 machines done out of 14, uh, at, during the 14-day time frame so far that I've been in the labs. Uh, among them, I have Pain, Humble, and Sufferance completed. Uh, so the top three uh, machines there. Uh, I have some scans currently running. Um, a lot of slowness issues in the labs. Uh, it, it's kind of ridiculous. I've actually saw one of my scans go from 80% complete to drop down to 45% complete and uh, increase in time to another two hours for one IP address. Uh, I have a ticket in. We'll see what they say about that and uh, maybe we can get things fixed. I ran multitude of speed tests on my side, pack captures on my side, try to rule out all my network equipment and my network beforehand. Uh, I'm pushing about 200 plus megabits uh, according to the speed test sites. And they're not always fully accurate, but I pay for about, I, I pay for quite a bit of bandwidth actually. And I, I know I don't get it all, uh, part of it being my router and things like that. Uh, not my router, but my modem. Uh, it doesn't have the higher channels to get up to the closer gigabit speeds. Um, but that's on my to-do list to purchase. But either way, I digress. So making great progress through the labs. Um, a couple other things going on here. So uh, a couple tips for this video today. Um, some things I, I came across over the last few days in the labs. Uh, MMAP-OX, so basically we're outputting our, uh, our MMAP uh, syntax and I see into a file. And that file is going to be greppable. But the, the cool thing here, I'm sorry, not greppable, but it's uh, XML format. But the cool thing here is, um, I don't know how I missed this before. Um, and I feel like such a noob now seeing this. But you can pipe um, or input your MMAP um, scan data into search split and have it automatically search for you. Now, it's not 100% accurate. Um, I have had good results with it so far. I would say two out of three times I've used it so far, I've been able to quickly pinpoint an exploit. So all you're really gonna do is you're gonna run your MMAP uh, scan and at the end of it, you're gonna put the dash OX, uh, a file name to save it to, and then basically you run your scan. And when it's all done, you'll have the data in a file. And this is good uh, also, just so you can go back and quickly reference it. Uh, so you're not constantly scanning. I, I usually copy my MMAP data into my uh, cherry tree notes and then I highlight the key areas that I want to go back to and make notes next to things like that. But to quickly try to find an uh, exploit for something, just pipe into the search exploit uh, was very helpful uh, for at least two, two three boxes. I say two out of three because the third box I had to modify the exploit quite a bit, not just changing shell code. Like, yeah, we learn how to change shell code in class or not really in class, but in your book, you're learning how to change the shell code. But this exploit actually had to be modified quite a bit. Uh, there was a couple of issues in it. Um, but then I was able to get it to work. Uh, app get. Um, so another great tool is uh, Rename. Uh, Rename, for some reason, is not installed by default on Kali. But if you do an app get uh, space install rename, this allows you to rename files using set expressions. So if I want to basically rename all files in a folder, to have a dash in there, basically remove that dash, I can run uh, this command here, uh, rename uh, s slash, and then backslash here is just an escape for the dash, and then slash slash. So basically replace all the dashes with nothing, and I'll take all the uh, names out. Now, the, the command does take some time to uh, run, depending on how big your directory is. So like if you're doing it against a, a folder that has like 30,000 files in it, it's gonna take some time to complete, so you gotta be patient there. Um, some other areas I've seen people running to uh, roadblocks on as I've been going through my labs is understand permissions for keys, uh, SSH keys, memory, they got to be very restrictive. Uh, you can't leave them as like 755, 700, whatever. Uh, you have to restrict them down to like 600 or less for them to actually work as a key. So if you do SSH-I, the key name, the user at the IP address, and you want that key to auto log you in, you got to set it to the uh, pretty restrictive permissions for that to work. Um, another key here is reading and understanding uh, basic exploits. I kind of mentioned this in my last video a bit, but I, I want to give you guys an example here. So there was an exploit where it's basically using uh, a, a whole bunch of keys and trying to use these keys against the service to try to get into the service to see if any of those keys worked. And 
for some reason the script wasn't working. Um, it, it was it was running. It was making me think it was working, but nothing was ever coming out. And I, I was getting errors, and I knew I had a working key because I had it working at one point. So I went back and I started looking at the code to see if I can basically reproduce this script myself to validate uh, what I'm seeing. So basically all this Python script was doing is basically it was a wrapper for basic uh, Linux commands. So we're using SSH um, inside there. We're defining the port. We're defining the option password then uh, notification equals no. So basically if the key doesn't work, don't prompt me for a password, move on to the next. Um, dash I for the key to use, the, the uh, file to use. And then basically just uh, reiterate through them all until you find a local one, uh, one that works. And when you find one that works, they'll connect you automatically. So <clears throat> I knew I had a working one. I couldn't figure out what the problem was while the script wasn't working. So I opened it up, changed it around. And then I started playing with the keys too. So down here you can see where I start, uh, started playing with some of the keys. Um, I redacted some information so uh, you guys don't know exactly what I'm looking at, but that's fine. Uh, I'll give you a, a gist of the code here. So basically, because the, the folder is so big with so many keys, we couldn't just do a straight out uh, cache. So basically what I did is I sent all the files to a folder. I, I listed it out and uh, redirected them all into a file called keys. And then for each name, uh, each line in the file keys, Basically, we renamed it, removing the dash in that file. And once we were done with that, we were able then to run that through and we were able to connect to the machine and it worked fine. Uh, I don't know why the exploit uh, wouldn't take the dashes in the key names, but just like most things I've come to learn with the OSCP, they usually ch change, modify things slightly um, to make you try harder to think deeper, things like that. Um, so if anyone knows what I'm talking about here and has successfully completed that box, let me know if you had to change the names or if you got it to work another way. I would love to understand uh, what I was doing wrong, if I was doing something wrong. So uh, if you have completed that box and you know which box this is, feel free to reach out to me. Uh, don't post it in the comments. Uh, I don't want people uh, getting an unfair advantage and seeing what box it is and basically spoiling for them. Um, shoot me an email, contact me on Twitter uh, or another means and let me know uh, how you got that to work. Uh, suit Provest, um, there's tons and tons of articles out there about uh, suit uh, abuse, how to basically use a suit file to get admin. And most of those articles talk about um, well-known uh, executables like Nmap, uh, VI, things like that, that normally don't have suit permissions set. Um, or the older version of Nmap no longer comes with that. Uh, Nmap no longer has that interact mode um, that's being used. So I struggled yesterday on a custom executable I found that had sewage permissions. Um, looking at the code uh, using tools such as Ltrace, strace, uh, strings, I was able to determine uh, possibility of an attack vector. And I couldn't really wrap my head around how I can do it based on some of the information I was reading. But then I stumbled upon this link here, uh, reverseengineeringstackexchange.com. So just a stack exchange talking about uh, looking at code and how to exploit it. And they were using basic, uh, they were using a custom uh, exploit that had uh, standard um, commands in there. Actually, what I'll do is I'll actually bring this up for you guys and I'll show you this article real fast. Um, and explain uh, something here. <clears throat> Open a new window because I have stuff running in the other windows. Okay. So this user here basically found, <clears throat> he says, I have an exploit. I have to exploit application. I have a, uh, only 32 bit elf executable, which is also stripped, which is also stripped. It's a sewage root application. And when it's executed, particularly run the ls al command. For specific directories. So basically this suit application is basically using an execute function to launch a, a native command. So similar to the application I had at hand, the application at suit is launching a native command. How do you exploit it? So this user here has a comment here where he talks about basically create a uh, file called ls. So you're creating that file called ls in your, basically, your your root folder, your the working directory you're in, 
Um, and then basically what you're going to do to it is you're going to execute it, but you're going to change the path of function. So your, your path, you're going to update your path with a dot um, in it. So basically it's going to run from your local path first, um, looking for that file, that executable name. So for example, if I, if ls is normally in user slash bin ls, and I put that dot in my path, what it's going to do is look in my, my home first for that file ls before it goes to the user bin. Uh, if it finds it in my home, it's going to run that version of ls and not the home one. So what's actually happening here is the, the script that can run a steward basically with root permissions is going to say, all right, I need ls, but ls is located in the home. That's fine. I can use that. Boom, and run, and then you get your shell, depending on what you put in there, right? In this case, he's putting um, a shell into it. So slash bin slash sh is so changing your shell to sh, but giving you root access at the same time. <clears throat> so that was very helpful. It, it made the most sense, easiest way to use it. Quick, quick exploit and escalation after I found this article. So I figured this article would be helpful for others. Um, and then some other tools I used in help with this. Um, Ltrace and strace, um, I did not find them on Kali. Uh, by default, I installed them myself. But uh, on the victim, uh, on the box I was t attacking, it only had S trace, but not L trace, which was kind of interesting. It was still helpful, um, but whenever you find executables you want to look at uh, and try to figure out what they're doing, um, of course you're looking for sewage, but then you have commands such as file. So you can run file and then the uh, name of the file and it'll tell you some information about the file. Strings is a great command to run against the file. It looks for any type of um, let's say plain text in there or other information that you may be able to easily decipher. Uh, Ltrace, strace, uh, start getting a little more advanced into the decompiling side of things, uh, as well as like uh, LDD, so uh, Linux uh, library loads. Um, so basically it'll show you dynamically mapped uh, libraries, which is another attack vector for some sewage files uh, where you can abuse uh, dynamically uh, linked libraries. So, some great uh, information here, some great tips here. Uh, I'm still going through a lot of the lab material. Uh, I need to actually get back in the book and stop playing the labs. Uh, I kind of fell victim to that the first time. I'm kind of falling victim to it the second time. It's just I've been traveling a lot, and it's easier to carry my laptop than carrying this big, heavy book with me. So I've been doing more just attacking and trying to get some boxes I haven't done yet uh, in the bag and wrapped up. Um, let me know what you think about these videos. Uh, some of you guys like them. Most of you guys like them, I should say. Um, I always get a bad C that always gives me a, a thumbs down for some reason, but whatever. Um, if you like the videos, make sure you subscribe. If you don't like the videos, have a good day. Move along. Um, share them with your friends. Uh, click the bell so you get notified when uh, new updates come out. Uh, if you're looking for any material, check out the store below. Um, if you have any questions about some material that you are looking at purchasing, such as like any books and things like that, that I might have used before or referenced before, let me know. I'll give you my honest feedback about them. Uh, if you have any questions, post them below. If they're not directly related to the OCP, like I'm not going to say, I'm not going to give you information about the OCP in the sense of spoilers or anything like that. Um, but if you have any just general questions around pen testing or my methodologies, my thought process, or something you'd like to see in these videos, let me know. All right, guys, have a great day, and I look forward to seeing you at the next one.